Settle down, our next speaker. I first met uh, this wonderful woman about a year ago, and I'm now going to hear her for the third time, and it's always wonderful to hear what she's got to say. Dr. Stasha Gominick grew up and attended college in California, then moved to Houston for a medical school at Baylor College of Medicine, where she received an MD in 1983. Her neurology residency was done at the Harvard-affiliated Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She practiced neurology in the San Francisco Bay Area, area from 1991 to 2004, before moving with her husband to Tyler, Texas. Starting in 2004, she began to dedicate more of her practice to the treatment of sleep and sleep disorders. In 2012 and 2016, she published two pivotal articles about the global struggle with worsening sleep, the possible causes and solutions. Uh, they were related to vitamin D deficiency and the intestinal microbiome. In 2016, she retired from clinical practice to have more time to teach. She currently divides herself between sleep right coaching sessions for private individuals and teaching other clinicians the right sleep method for sleep repair. So, Dr. Gamanek, would you please come up? Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> uh, first, I'd like to thank Nick and uh, Don Ewing for inviting me. And I am a neurologist. I'm now a uh, retired neurologist. I think it's a little too high. And I am actually practicing as a coach. I'm a sleep coach now, and I practice virtually around the world helping people sleep better. I want to share with you some pretty new ideas about sleep and why many of you in this room and most of your clients and patients have trouble with their sleep. But first, I want to ask the group a couple of questions. I'm going to, for the purpose of these questions, I'm going to say that anyone who asks their patients about their sleep, about how tired they are, or incorporates questions about sleep, in their history taking, we're going to call you a sleep practitioner. I don't care what initials come after your name. I love the fact that these groups include people who are not DDSs or DMDs or MDs. We all provide very important care for our patients. So I'm going to say, would any of you in the room that have been sleep practitioners for five years or less raise your hand, please? Great. Now, those of you who have been sleep practitioners for 10 years or less. Great. Now, those of you who have been sleep practitioners for 20 years or less. Okay, so there are some people in the room that don't include themselves as sleep practitioners. I want to speak to them as well as everyone who raised your hand. Think about the number of years that have been spent in the people in this room thinking about sleep and about why their patients don't sleep well and feel rested. We've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Now, how many of you in this room are 100% satisfied with your patient outcomes regarding their sleep and the current modalities that you're using. Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. If you are 100% satisfied with your outcomes, I want to sit next to you at lunch because I have things <laughs> that I don't know that you might be able to teach me. The impressive thing about that is nobody raises their hand. That means we're in this room, we're seeking to learn because we are dissatisfied with our outcomes. Think about that. We've been thinking about sleep. We all sleep. Many of us are dissatisfied with our sleep. We're all thinking about why we don't sleep well. But we're not satisfied with our outcomes. That lack of satisfaction is the door. It opens with our curiosity. As long as we're dissatisfied, we're still curious. I'm going to present you some ideas today 
that are pretty unique ideas. And David, for some reason, I'm not going forward, even though I was in the past. <clears throat> Should I use the button on the computer? Oh, there we go. Okay. Just push harder? No. Okay. I teach courses about the material I'm going to give you today to clinicians. <clears throat> Therefore, I do gain money from giving these courses, which is actually a, a giving of information. I don't have any products per se. This information are, that I'm going to give you today are very new ideas, and they are all hypotheses. They are my ideas. Keep in mind that everything that all of us in this room have learned are all ideas proposed by other human beings. So we're learning these ideas as the truth. But those of us who have been practicing for more than 10 or 15 years begin to recognize that the things that we were taught in school as the truth change. 15 years later, they're not the truth anymore. So there's nothing wrong with making up ideas about how our patients' bodies work. In fact, that's all we have. We live in a time when I can look at my refrigerator and decide I want to learn about refrigeration, and I can learn everything there is to know about that refrigerator. It's completely logical that our patients and we should assume that we can do the same for our bodies. I should be able to look at this person's body and know everything about it in this age of information. But in actual fact, those of us who have been practicing for a while understand that the only thing that's really true in the room when you're sitting with the patient is what the patient says about the experience of their body. The stories I make up to answer that person's question about why, why is this happening to me, they are stories. That means if my story fixes you, then it's probably a pretty good story. But if we're dissatisfied because we're not completely successful, then we should always have an open mind about the stories that we tell. So view all the information I'm going to give you with that in mind. I'm about to tell you the story about why I'm up here in front of you. And it's an interesting story, but I want all of you to come out of this room with the idea that these are new ideas that I might be able to learn to use to make my patients better and to advance this field myself. All of my ideas are built on the shoulders of others, and you will then bring more information to the fore to help your patients in the future. So why are we all here? It's because lousy sleep is the new normal. And was it always this way? No, it wasn't. And <clears throat> I don't think it was this way, and I happen to be pretty old. So I lived before it was the normal. When I was growing up, nobody had any trouble with their sleep. They did not have adverse reactions to immunizations. They did not commit suicide at age 12. And they didn't uh, constantly need antidepressants. And my generation was the generation that had sleep studies done at Stanford that started all of our normal tests of sleep. So. What I'm going to convince you of today is our habit of going inside, our current life of living indoors is related to this change in sleep in a multi-step process. I'm going to break it down into three simple steps. The first is the brain runs the oral airway during sleep. This is not to denigrate the importance of the oral airway. I've been lecturing to dentists now for three years and I usually sit through all the conferences, so I have learned a lot about the oral airway. And I am a big believer that what you dentists who are doing growth appliances are doing for our young people is, and adults now is pivotal in getting them better. So throughout this lecture, I'm going to be lecturing about the brain because it's my area. But that is not to minimize the oral airway importance. 
But we call it sleep apnea because it only happens while you're sleeping. That means the brain is controlling the airway while we're asleep. The second surprising thing, for me anyway, and hopefully for you, and hopefully you'll be a believer by the time you leave this room, is that vitamin D plays a huge role in controlling sleep. And even more surprising is that the microbiome controls our sleep. This is getting to be an easier sell for me as more and more articles are coming out talking about the fact that the microbiome is directly connected to the brain, which is a pretty bizarre experience for someone who's been a neurologist as long as I have been. And it turns out when you drop the vitamin D throughout the whole population around the globe, the sleep starts to suffer. And when you drop the vitamin D, the microbiome goes bad. I'm going to explain to you how I think those two are linked and how to fix it. Here is my final message to you, very simplified. There are two cycles of the planet. We evolved on this planet. Our sleep evolved on this planet. You know about the first cycle, the circadian cycle. <clears throat> Sunlight entering the eye using retinoids like vitamin A link our sleep to our daily day-night cycle. The part that we missed was that we are also linked to the annual cycle. Another quote-unquote vitamin that's really a hormone, vitamin D, is made on the skin again through sunlight entering the skin, makes a hormone that then governs our ability to change our sleep and our metabolism so we sleep longer in the winter and gain weight in the winter. Think of the survival advantage for any animal that can do that. So, giving you the punchline at the beginning, <clears throat> here's the rest of the story. Now, one of the first things that we should all be thinking about is, vitamin D was discovered as a chemical in the 1940s. Why is this neurologist standing up here telling me that it's related to sleep? That was pretty shocking to me too. Now, I have to tell you that this was my reaction. Those of us who have professional initials after our name are mostly in the habit of saying, I stay up with the literature. How come I don't know about this? It must not be important or it must not be true. Those of you in this room are kind of specially selected because you are the people who think outside of the box. So you're battling against this tendency, and I'm proud of you for not believing this. <clears throat> I'm frozen. I'm frozen. <clears throat> okay. What I'm going to do is tell you the background of the story, because this is a very odd story. Vitamin D has been in the literature since the 1940s. Why would it take us this long to figure out that it is directly chemically related to how we sleep, how we get paralyzed in sleep, how the airway functions in sleep? Is it working now? <clears throat> Or something. No, oh. it's just Sorry, guys. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I want to give you a little bit of the history. This is going to seem unnecessary to you and um, an odd <clears throat> side history, but it's really important. Vitamin D was discovered in the 1940s by physicians and scientists who were of a mind that rickets, a bone disorder, was caused by a nutritional deficiency. The idea of nutritional deficiencies was a pretty new idea. We were moving into a time when people were more well-fed, and then they were starting to study whether there were certain diseases that came when people were not well-fed. One of the problems was that these rats that we study, we study them because we don't like them. Which is kind of ironic because they like us. 
The reason why we don't like them is they come into our house at night and they sneak around and they steal our food. That's why they like us. One, they have a particular niche within the animal world. They are nocturnal. We're sleeping. They're awake. They come in and take our food. We're one of the few animals that stores our food in big piles. Now, because we don't like them, we study them. We chose this animal to study for rickets. What's the problem? Well, for rickets, they have a similar setup to humans. But for sleep, they sleep during the day, and they don't go outside during the day. They are not exposed to vitamin D from the sun. That means they actually were able to find vitamin D that was made by fungus, the same vitamin D you can get from eating mushrooms. It is infinitely older than the vitamin D that we make on our skin, that all animals, back to reptiles and insects, all animals that are day hunters or day livers, <clears throat> uh, day survivors, um, use to make their body respond to vitamin D in multiple actions. They found this vitamin D called D2 in the food that the rats were being given. It was really produced by a mold growing on the, on the grain that the rats were being given. And that was the first chemical that corrected rickets. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, 10 years later, someone happened to look at the skin of a pig that had been left out in the sun and found D3 that was chemically very similar to D2. And then D3 had to be compared to D2. They missed the fact that the chickens didn't really like D2 very much. They missed the fact that this is not actually a nutrient. It is not a nutrient for any of the animals that go out in the sun and make D3 in their fur, in their feathers, in their scales, from UVB light hitting them, and then lick that thing, a hormone, off of their skin. So the irony of this is, it does come in orally for most animals. It turns out that humans and pigs are the only bald animals on the planet. There are very few animals that are completely bald. We happen to absorb vitamin D directly through our skin, but that's relatively unique within the animal kingdom. Most animals lick themselves. That means we actually are designed to be able to take vitamin D orally and directly through the skin. Now, what's the problem? As soon as we go inside, we don't make any vitamin D. As soon as the medical industry says vitamin D and all other vitamins are not important, and we miss the connection with our habits of going outside, there are several things that become wrong about our assumptions linking vitamin D as a vitamin and a nutrient to the problems of sleep. So that's a little bit of a background. Now here's the real irony. <clears throat> 30 years later, a very important vitamin D lab run by Hector De Luca. This is 30 years later. This is big, big into science now. We've made huge advances from the 1940s. They publish an article in 1979 showing that there are vitamin D receptors in the intestinal tract, the stomach, the kidney, the skin, the pituitary, and the parathyroid. At this point, this lab begins to publish one article after another, most of them by Walter Stumpf, who you're gonna learn about, saying that vitamin D is, number one, not a nutrient. It is a hormone. Walter Stumpf was a hormone chemist. He first started in estrogen. He was very interested in where the hormones had their activity, how hormones could have hundreds of effects throughout the body different effects in different places. How did they manage to do that? So over a number of years, over 30 years, Walter began to publish really important articles. He used very specific, very scientific techniques that showed where the vitamin D receptors were. What you'll see here are some kind of shocking things considering that even today, there are people who are big in the vitamin D literature 
and are giving advice to the FDA who still believe that vitamin D is a nutrient, who still believe that we should be pressuring the World Health Organization to be putting vitamin D in the milk of poor countries so they'll have better health. That's in the setting of what I'm about to tell you about the fact that as we've all moved indoors, our sleep has decayed, our microbiome has decayed, and our health has worsened terribly. So back in the early 80s, Walter begins to publish articles about vitamin D receptors in the brain, vitamin D receptors in the spinal cord, in the sensory ganglia, articles about vitamin D light and reproduction. He's already proposing in 1989 that when the vitamin D goes low, infertility goes up in both males and females. Vitamin D in psychiatry. He's already telling us that seasonal affective disorder is related to us going indoors, not just because of our light perception with our eye, but because of the light that hits our skin. Keep in mind that this is when dermatology is starting to tell us that we shouldn't be outside without sunscreen on. Vitamin D receptors in the heart, vitamin D is directly related to heart failure. Salivary glands, epithelium, myoepithelial cells, vitamin D targets. Vitamin D is in the core of the tooth. It is directly related to tooth health from the very beginning of the development of the tooth buds. He's publishing all of this stuff, over 300 articles in 30 years. Why don't you know about it? That's a very fascinating thing. Now, I'm gonna show you why I know about it. But here's what Walter starts to write in the early 80s. This is the literature that I fell into as a neurologist, already fully formed. He already has a context that explains why we would have a boss hormone vitamin D, that linked to UVB light. Why UVB and not something else? Because UVB light is the only wavelength that goes away in the winter. That means if you go to the north on our planet or to the south of the equator, this chemical allows us to change our metabolism, our fertility, and our sleep, i.e. it runs hibernation, and it allows us to be more successful, to actually have success in our fertility. You don't want to have your babies when there is no food. Your species will not survive. There are vitamin D receptors all over the pituitary, which means you have a different state of metabolism. The thyroid hormone goes down, which allows your full metabolism to go down. This is how animals hibernate. This is how we hibernate in the winter. Now, what nobody expected was that the vitamin D would go down and stay down <clears throat> for long periods of time. This is Walter Stumpf. The reason why I'm bringing up Walter is because this is a very good example of one of the things that all of us in this room face. When we want to convey a new idea to other human beings, it turns out that the idea is not the whole core of the issue. The second issue is, who am I in relation to you? Should you believe my idea? What if this idea is different than the accepted idea within medicine? Within medicine? So one of the experiences that I had falling into this vitamin D world was I read Walter's 30 years of articles and say, this is perfectly logical. In fact, in 1983, I could have been learning this in my endocrinology in medical school, and I begin to think of the hundreds and thousands of patients who would have had a different outcome. We didn't know much about sleep at that time, and the sleep epidemic was still forming, but if we had learned Walter's frame of mind very early on, when the dermatologists come forward and say, you know, it's really bad to be in the sun, there will be some of us who would say, you know, vitamin D has a lot of effects in other parts of the body. And what you're really telling me is you're so focused on your own organ of the body that you will be sacrificing these hundreds of other things that will happen to my body when my vitamin D goes low. None of us had that opportunity because none of the rest of the vitamin D community, the vitamin D experts, the big dogs is what I'll call them, would accept his point of view. Why? 
So I read all of his stuff, and it takes me about five years to finally get to a place where I understand why. Walter's story is that he has now passed away, but I had the opportunity to spend time with him before he died. He was born in Berlin. He was actually at an age where he was conscripted into the Nazi army. He served as a Nazi soldier. He was in a prisoner of war camp. Then when the Germans lost the war, he went back to East Berlin. Therefore, he was an obligate communist. He went to medical school and became a neurologist. And then he was able to sneak across from East Berlin to West Berlin at a time before the wall came. Then, through a series of events, he was able to distinguish himself enough that he was able to come and do a fellowship in the 1960s and 70s in hormone receptor research. When I finally went to the vitamin D workshop, which is an annual meeting, and the reason why I went to that meeting and I'm going to teach you how I fell into this vitamin D stuff, but at the time, I thought I was well-informed. I thought I knew everything that was applicable to my field. I was very, very interested in sleep, and that's how I entered this field. I finally went to the vitamin D workshop because I had ordered a book about vitamin D that I thought was about the mechanisms. It turned out instead to be a book that summarized the 932 forms of vitamin D, all called vitamin D, that had been produced by the pharmaceutical industry because they were convinced they could make a better vitamin D than the vitamin D that every single animal on this planet makes and uses. And those animals have been making and using that since multi-celled organisms began to exist. So vitamin D2 came with yeast and fungus. That means this is an infinitely old chemical. So the level of arrogance of the pharmaceutical industry to think that they are going to make a better chemical, and what I've just seen in my patients is that vitamin D can heal the sleep or it can ruin the sleep, and I feel compelled to go to a meeting of the big dogs and at least put the idea in their heads that if we don't recognize that vitamin D has effects in the brain, when this pharmaceutical study happens and the study participants come back and tell me, the doctor who's running the study, you know, that chemical made me really depressed. If I don't recognize that that's a possibility, I am likely to discount it. So I went to the vitamin D workshop and through a various methods of talking to the big dogs whose names I recognize from all the articles I've been reading, I was able to ask a question at one of the social events. And I happened to ask it of one of the guys who's the most outspoken of the group. And there are many different views. Vitamin D is a very controversial area still. This particular man, uh, I said, why is it that nobody sees the vitamin D world the way Walter did? And he said, well... Walter was an asshole. He really was arrogant. He would come to these meetings. He would stand up at the speaker podium, and he would say, none of you guys really recognize that I'm the only person who really understands what's going on here. And you don't quote my articles enough. And for the first time, I realized thousands, millions of people have died because... We all share this one thing. Everyone in this room, we're all primates. We can't shrug off that primateness. We exist in groups. All animals that exist in groups have a pecking order. They're very sensitive to status. Therefore, when Walter goes to a group and he's arrogant, and I believe he, the reason why I told you his history is picture this guy with a heavy German accent coming into the US at a time when Nazis were not popular, communists were not popular. He starts into science and his first articles are about estrogen receptors in the brain. His colleagues respond to him by saying, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. There can't be estrogen receptors in the brain. Well, any woman or man who's lived with another woman knows there are estrogen receptors in the brain. Give me a break. So he publishes this first article. His colleagues tell him he's crazy. 
And from then on, this chip on his shoulder just grows larger and larger. That affected me greatly because my, by this time, I had already been somewhat beat up by my colleagues in Tyler, Texas, who used to think I was really smart, who now thought I was a total whack job because I was very interested in my patient's sleep. I was putting little signs on their doors in the hospital saying, do not wake this patient for x-rays, bathing, or lab tests between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. That caused a real furor in the hospital. And then after that, I was doing vitamin D levels. And I had the, the gall to actually do vitamin D levels on some of my colleagues' patients. So I had started to experience this developing chip on my shoulder that Walter had. Now that I've seen that it held up his ability to talk to other humans who needed to know about this, I began to learn more about how to convey new ideas to other humans without causing their arrogance to rise and without causing them to react against me. I'm still learning how to do that, but this is a very important part when you walk out of this room, your eyes will be open. You will not be able to unlearn what I've told you, but the people in your community will not know it. It's important that we all keep in mind what we want, what's our final intention, that our patients should do better. That means we have to be able to co-opt our colleagues into this way of thinking. That's why I put this in here. It's a very important part of conveying the ideas that we want to convey. So, in Walter's honor, I will now tell you, and we published an article together, which is why <clears throat> we're talking about it. Now, how did I get here? Here's what happened to me. I'm very interested in sleep. I have to admit that as an MD, I thought that vitamins were ridiculous. Okay, I remembered that I learned about them in medical school. Those of you in this group are a selected group that do not think that vitamins are ridiculous, but I did. So I understand the point of view of people who are still not educated, let me say. So I entered this field of vitamins, and we're going to talk a lot about vitamins in the next hour, through sleep. And it happened pretty much by accident. One of my headache patients said... I've taken f four separate medicines over the last two years. I still have daily headache. So half my practice was daily headache sufferers. Usually young, healthy females, had a couple of kids, don't have any medical problems. They have daily headache, they're seeing a neurologist. One of my patients said, you know, my husband says I snore like a train. This is in 2004, 2005, okay? At that time, nobody was saying that young, healthy females could have sleep apnea. I personally had the same training that everybody else in the room did at that time. Fat, older males with a big fat neck. That's what I've been trained. Low oxygen to the brain. That, I bought the story that the pulmonologist sold us. So my patient said, I think I have sleep apnea. I want a sleep study. And I said, I don't know anything about that. I'm not going to do it. And she said, I want you to do it anyway. I said, OK. So she goes for a sleep study. She has sleep apnea. She's not overweight. She comes back. It's not so important to me whether she has sleep apnea. Her headaches are gone. She's wearing this torture device. Her head hurts to touch the pillow. Daily headache sufferers, their hair hurts to touch it. She's strapped on this torture device, and her headaches are gone in three or four weeks. And I'm totally blown away by that. My idea about headache is the head pain switch can be in the on position or the off position. It's supposed to go on when you hit your head to tell you it's not a good idea to hit your head. Instead, it can go on inappropriately from a genetic disorder where you have little channels that are turning on inappropriately and the electricity of your head pain switch is deranged. So I have my whole idea about this and I'm giving out these chemicals. None of the chemicals we use for daily headache are actually have a recognized mechanism, except they're all channel active. So I'm thinking chemistry, I'm talking chemistry, I'm talking biochemistry, and all of a sudden I think, she didn't have any drops in oxygen. She just stopped breathing. Could that mean that 
this apnea stuff is really just keeping her from having a long enough block of rapid eye movement sleep or a long enough block of the deep sleep that allows her to make her own chemicals. We all run on chemicals. That's the way I think about the body. So she gets better and now I have hundreds of patients with daily headache. So I start to do sleep studies on all of them. Now what I end up with are thousands of sleep studies over a period of five years and in the second year, my pulmonologist mentions to me, I happen to have a very smart pulmonologist who's reading most of my sleep studies, and I'm sending a lot of sleep studies to this guy. He says, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, but, well, you know that the po population you're sending to me are young, healthy people. I'm sending, by now, teenagers, kids. I'm sending almost anybody who let me. And he says, the population you're sending is really different. I don't know if you've noticed this, but, a lot of them have REM-related apnea. They only have apnea in rapid eye movement sleep. I said, no, that's, I didn't notice that. In fact, I don't think that's on the report. I said, no, it's not. And I said, well, what do you mean it's not? And he said, well, you know, what we do is we take the number of apneic episodes and we average it over the whole night. So I have a young woman who has a half an hour of ra rapid eye movement sleep when she should have two hours. Already that's significant. But that's not commented on in the report either. Nobody comments on the fact that most or all of my patients have no rapid eye movement sleep. That's not on the report. And when he points that out to me and I start to read the second and third page and teach myself how to read sleep studies, I realize that's not on the front page that I've been looking at, wondering why it is that this person has daily headache and depression and can't remember anything, and she has apnea. And this person has all the same complaints but has no significant apnea. I'm struggling with what's the difference, and then I begin to realize every single one of these studies shows that they don't have the right amount of deep sleep. And it's not commented on because, as I tell my patient, you know, you don't have any rapid eye movement sleep. What would I ask? Well, why? Why don't I have REM sleep? And nobody has an answer. And I proceed to read the literature, and there are no articles at that point in time linking daily headache or anything else to no REM sleep because nobody knows why these people have reduced REM. Why would I have an eight-year-old who stops breathing only in rapid eye movement sleep? And what about those leg movements? So now I'm actually reading hundreds of sleep studies that have very similar outcomes. But we don't know why and we don't have anything to give them. My level of frustration is going up and up. I have CPAP masks that I can use for someone who stops breathing. I look in the back of the throat. Admittedly, I'm not good at that, but I'm looking for an oral airway problem. So a kid with big tonsils gets sent to get the tonsils out. But most of the people I'm looking at have normal airway as far as I can tell. And now, what do I do with everyone else? And oh, by the way, what about all my patients with insomnia? Insomnia is like the stepchild of sleep apnea. Nobody talks about it. Nobody has anything to say about it. Millions of people are suffering with this disease, and the best we can do is it's your own fault, you take sleeping pills, you do it wrong. My patients are a mix of young, healthy females, some males, kids, teenagers. Now I'm actually doing sleep studies in epilepsy patients, in tremor patients, in gait disorder patients, because I'm starting to believe, you know, the ones who I can get their sleep better, even if it's with these feeble sleeping pills, they do better. Their headaches get better. And I'm beginning to realize that some of the really old medicines, the tricyclic antidepressants that we used right at the beginning of when I was practicing, they actually make the headaches better because the sleep gets better. And I can make the epilepsy better if I can make the sleep better. What if all my patients who are coming in to see me actually have genetic disorders that become manifest because their sleep goes bad? 
I'm not seeing patients with tuberculosis of the spine or syphilis or polio. I'm seeing patients who have headache, vertigo, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease. These are all genetic disorders that as far as I can tell, they've had that gene mutation since the day they popped out. What does that mean? It means their brain, their body, has been able to find a way around that mutation until their ability to heal starts to go bad, i.e. their sleep starts to fail. That begins to suggest that the core of everything I've learned about in medicine is really about sleep and being able to heal our body. I know because I'm very healthy myself, or was until my 50s when I started to have a sleep disorder, that if you don't get sick, you don't go to the doctor. Wow, what a concept. What if there were human beings that didn't need a doctor assigned when they popped out? Wow, were there people who actually got to 75 years old who've never seen a doctor? Yeah. In fact, that was the way we were designed to be because there weren't any doctors for most of the time humans have been on the planet. So I begin to look at it in a totally different way, recognizing that my medications are a feeble copy trying to fill a hole that is developed because this patient is not sleeping normally. That all of the healing that happens in the hospital is really me standing next to the bedside trying to keep other people from killing this person while their body is healing itself. My focus is now completely on sleep. Now, why? Why would these people have sleep disorders? And because I'm seeing little kids who have headache and epilepsy, why would any kid that looks completely normal, beautiful child, fully formed, normal mentally, have a sleep disorder at all? I have sleep studies on these kids now that show they have a half an hour of REM, a half an hour of slow wave sleep. I'm beginning to understand that that means their development, both mentally and physically, has been shortened, has been shorted from the amount of time that the brain needs to accomplish normal development. And why would he be kicking so he's kicking and he has apnea. Why those two things? Why would he have any? So about this time, my pulmonologist says to me, I ask, well, what, what's up with this REM apnea? Why would they start having apnea? Is this, a, is this a progressive process? Does this mean that the older fat males are really at the most severe of a continuum of disease. And he says, well, maybe, but I think REM apnea is probably first because we get the most paralyzed of all in REM. And I said, we get paralyzed while we're sleeping? And he said, yeah, we get the most paralyzed in REM. We, we paralyze our oral pharynx. And I thought, well, that's dangerous. That's crazy. Why? How could we live when we get paralyzed while we're sleeping? If I don't swallow, I drown. Could that mean that the oral pharynx is getting too paralyzed and that could be the cause of sleep apnea? It's true that there might be some blockage, but if that blockage is the same when we're awake, how could we lie down on the couch and watch net Netflix without becoming apneic? And then as soon as we fall asleep, then we have apnea. Learning that we get paralyzed was pretty scary. Like, who's going to help me? Who's going to keep me from dying in the middle of the night? And now, as I'm studying these sleep studies, for those of you who are not deeply in sleep, I'm going to show you what we're doing on one of these recordings from a supervised sleep study. The top line the electroencephalogram is these little squiggles. The neurologists are very proud of these squiggles. Unfortunately, they really aren't the whole story, but they are recording the phase, the stage of sleep. Are you in deep sleep? Are you in light sleep? The second records the airflow. So there's a little monitor in your nose or in your mouth that measures whether air is flowing. These are little electrodes that are attached to the chest. Now, what happens on these sleep studies to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea is you have to see a lack of airflow 
that's accompanied by chest wall movements. The lungs are trying to bring in air, but the airway is closed. Now, this guy is dying. Is it the technician who runs in and says, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, wake up, you're dying. No, it's not. He actually has 30 apneic episodes an hour. What is it that wakes him up? What happens right here is called an arousal. The brain wakes him to light sleep. He only has this when he's in deep sleep, when he gets paralyzed. That means the brain knows that there's no air movement. The brain is set up to paralyze us, therefore, to keep us from dying, the reason why we're still all on this planet is that this whole system was designed to have supervision that tells us to wake to a lighter phase of sleep where we're not paralyzed and it saves our life. That's really important because it means that this wiring diagram was perfect. It was designed, it was exactly the same in the dinosaur as it is in us, and it was perfect then. It was in its millionth version, if you want to look at it as computers, and it was perfect then. And then it went bad in the last 40 years in humans. That's a really important thing. He's not wearing a CPAP mask. He has the identical brain stem to me and you. This is the reptilian brain. This part of the brain is called the brain stem. The place that's the control center for getting paralyzed is right here. It's called the nucleus pontus reticularis oralis caudalis. I have had a very difficult time memorizing that name. It is very obscure, and most people, even in neurology, know nothing about this. And I admit that I did not until I got into sleep, until I got into the idea that my patients are getting paralyzed incorrectly. Where does that happen in the brain? That's not about oxygen to the brain. None of my patients have drops in oxygen. This means, and oh, by the way, drops in oxygen to the brain result in stroke. I'm a neurologist. I see lots of strokes on the weekend. That means it is not the actual answer to say the diseases of sleep apnea result from low oxygen to the brain. That is the story the pulmonologist presented. And I believed it. I fell for it, just like everybody else did. But, in fact, now I'm very interested in how the brain actually runs this. And it turns out that the clock function and the paralysis functions are all in the brainstem, all in the reptilian brain. Now, the next part is pretty neurologic, and I'm going to try to get you to think about this in terms of the electricity that runs a steady state in our body is a special form of electricity. If I want to keep my arm right here, our electricity is not like the wires in the wall where there's a steady stream of electrons. When I'm trying to keep my arm right here, I have a certain rate of firing my neurons that keep the arm up and a certain rate of firing the neurons that put it down, and I match them. So they're all firing at the same rate, I can keep my arm right here. If I think about it that way, what these neurons in the brainstem are trying to do is they're trying to achieve perfect paralysis in very important muscles that keep my airway open and allow me to swallow. What if these neurons are wobbling a little bit. So part of the time they're a little too paralyzed, some of the time they're not paralyzed enough. Well, when they're too paralyzed, you're not gonna lose from the neck down because you're supposed to be paralyzed from the neck down. That means if they're not paralyzed enough, maybe that's about these periodic limb movements that we see. And as I'm reading these articles, I find some about the fact that there's a very primitive walking nucleus that's right next to these nuclei where we get paralyzed. So when the paralysis isn't right, what we see are what's, what are called periodic limb movements of sleep. They're called periodic become, because they come at a regular rhythm. They're actually walking. Now, one of the weird things I noticed about my headache patients was these are young, healthy females, average 32 years old. They'll come to see me for their headaches, and then they'll wear a CPAP mask, and they come back and say things like, you know, my headaches are better since I'm wearing this, and you know what's weird? My hip pain is better. And I'm thinking, 
we're blowing air up their nose and their hip pain is better. I don't get it. And, I, you know, there wasn't a drop in oxygen. There's no oxygen. We're just blowing air up there. We're just allowing them to stay in deep sleep. And I start to postulate that these leg movements, if we're supposed to get paralyzed, which ap apparently we are, that has to have some purpose. Maybe the moving parts must get paralyzed in order to repair. We are using those limbs all day long. And then we lie down, we get paralyzed, and a repair process happens. So if I can get them to be better paralyzed at night, maybe I can help their joint pain. And I start to play around with some of the medicines that we use for periodic limb movements of sleep. None of them really work. We use a lot of, I use a lot of dopamine. But I start to think of this as, gee, maybe this is more than just too paralyzed around the oral airway. Maybe the lack of paralysis is also causing disease. So I postulate this theory, and I postulate this firing rate. And I'm such a geek that what I'm reading at this point are these weird articles where the hair-like electrode is placed in one of these pacemaker dopamine cells in the brainstem that starts firing when it's first formed in utero and continues to fire at the same rate your whole life, just like the pacemakers in the heart. There's a timing system that is centered in the brain that has pacemakers in, in, in the brainstem. And sleep is tightly bound to the timing. It's tightly bound, as I told you, to the cycles of our planet. So I start to read these articles and see these scientists putting in these little electrodes, of course, in rats, and dropping little neurotransmitters on them. We put epinephrine on, and the rate changes. And the time between the beats begins to change. And I begin to realize that these guys are doing experiments that are actually duplicating what's happening in my patients. They're changing the firing rate, and they're therefore changing the success of the paralysis. So I'm thinking all of this stuff. Nobody's interested in it but me. My poor husband has to put up with me babbling about this stuff at cocktail parties, and he's really tired of it. But I come up with this idea. What if apnea is too paralyzed, and not paralyzed enough is grinding or kicking or sleeping like this so you get carpal tunnel. It's a decent model, but now what? Okay, so I'm bringing you to this point because I'm thinking about the brain and about sleep disorders in a totally different way. And for the first time, I'm thinking, you know, I think we missed the boat when we disregarded the brain. The oral airway is part of this, especially in children who are developing, especially in the last 20 to 25 years but it might be in both locations, and both locations have to be concentrated on. And then a very lucky event happens. I have an 18-year-old with daily headache, beautiful girl, about to go to college. I give her verapamil. That's the daily headache medicine we choose for her, but I also send her for a sleep study. She sleeps for 10 hours a night, and she's still tired, but she sleeps, so I can't give her a sleeping pill. Her sleep study shows that she has no deep sleep. She is asleep for 10 hours. She wakes up 35 times an hour. She never stops breathing. And now I'm completely stuck because I have nothing to give her. I can't give her a sleeping pill. I can't give her a CPAP device. And she says, you know, my headaches are a lot better, but I'm still very tired. I sleep and I'm just fatigued. I'm exhausted in the morning. And I'm looking at her sleep study thinking, in 10 years, this gal's going to come back and see me for a stroke. She doesn't have any time that she repairs her body. Why would a normal, beautiful 18-year-old have no deep sleep? And out of desperation, I say, well, did your doctor do any of those fatigue labs? And she says, I don't know. What are those? And I said, I don't know. I don't do that either. And well, let's do a thyroid and a B12. She happens to have a B12 that's like 170. It's really low, low enough that even a dumb neurologist who's never done a B12 in a headache patient in her life actually pays attention to it. And because I'm such a geek and I'm thinking about these pacemaker cells that are firing, I'm thinking, wow, maybe her pacemaker cells are low in B12 and they can't go to the fallback cycles that we might use when we're low in B12. And they can't really say, hey, take it, buddy. I have to do this uh, second cycle because I'm low in this cofactor that I need. And I'm also seeing patients in the hospital that have B12 deficiency because now I'm doing B12s in those patients too, and they have AFib, and they're having strokes at age 42, and I'm thinking, wow, what if this were a deficiency state where these cells don't have the cofactors they need 
to do their job properly, and it's affecting these paralysis and timers before the other parts of the body. And I actually walk out of the room and I go to Google, because that's now my neurology textbook, and I type in the uh, consequences of B12 deficiency, and Google says, fatigue, daily headache. And I just freak out, I think, oh my God, I've been doing headache as a specialty. I wasn't trained in it, but nobody likes to do daily headaches, so I just happen to have hundreds of patients with daily headache. I've never done a B12 level in a headache patient in my life. No one has written about it that way. So I go to the neurology literature and I realize it's not written in the neurology literature. If you look in the neurology textbook under B12 deficiency, headache is one of the listed symptoms. But if you look under what should you do with a patient who has headache, there's no discussion of sleep or B12 deficiency, despite the fact that I now know that all of my daily headache patients have sleep disorders. So I'm thrilled by this discovery. And I'm thinking, okay, we're gonna give back B12. And I start, instead of doing sleep studies, I start to do B12 levels, and everybody that I'm seeing who has daily headache or anything else, everybody who's had a sleep study gets a B12 level. About a month into it, one of my patients who has a million things wrong with her says to me, you know, my doctor did my vitamin D level and it was low, and she gave me vitamin D and my wrist pain went away. If she had said that second part, I would not have been interested. I don't know about vitamins. I don't care about vitamins. I was still in that mindset. So I thought, well, I'm drawing blood anyway. Let's throw the vitamin D in there. So I throw in a vitamin D, and I was still interested in the fact that some of the patients could get a better result with their pain when I got their sleep better, but some of them didn't. And I'm still thinking, okay, vitamin D bone. I know the same thing that you guys know. So I throw in a vitamin D level, and I have to admit this was not a prospective case-controlled trial. It was just a clinician sitting in her office questioning what could be wrong with my patients. I'm making that point to you because we will then go over how do we study sleep. Every single one of you who has patients, you are on the front line listening to that patient's story. You are the only person who is actually interested in that person, that particular person, getting better. We serve a very important role our role has been minimized. Everybody wants to do evidence-based medicine, which is another code word for, was it a drug company financed huge study? This was not that. This was just a clinician with an open mind who was desperate because there weren't any articles. So I start to do vitamin D levels, and by complete accident, I'm doing vitamin D levels in August through December in Texas they should have their highest vitamin D levels at this time. But in fact, everyone had a low vitamin D. They're all below 30. So I know nothing about it. I'm just looking at the lab. Two months into it, I'm tired of writing my lab slip every single night 15 times. Take 1,000 IUs of vitamin D because your vitamin D is low. And I decide that I'm going to Xerox the lab slip. So I just Xerox it. It has that written in all of them, which I'm admitting to you because it's lazy and awful and it's not scientific, but it resulted in a weird accident. Two guys that had vitamin Ds that were actually a little bit higher than all the gals got a letter from me saying, take 1,000 IUs of vitamin D. So I'm 40 months into this. Two guys wind up coming into my office within a week in December of 2009 saying, you know, you made me wear this CPAP mask for the last year. My wife will tell you I wear it every night, and my headaches did not get any better, and you promised me it would. And I say, I'm sorry. He said, no, I have another thing to tell you. You sent me that little note about taking the vitamin D last time I was in here. I started to take it, and about three weeks later, I started to sleep better, and my headaches went away. Two men told me the same thing in a week. Now, by now, I have several hundred patients who have lab slips that show the B12 is low some of the time, the sickest of the sick. But the vitamin D is almost always low. And I'm giving what turns out to be a minuscule dose of vitamin D, but a clinical effect in two guys who are using a CPAP mask, who have sleep apnea, who both say the same thing, unprompted. Why would vitamin D have anything to do with sleep? So here's what happens. <clears throat> I go to the literature, and I find this guy, who you learned about. It turns out that he has articles 
about the nucleus reticularis pontus oralis caudalis. Like, who even knows about that? This guy in the 1980s has actually published articles specifically referring to these nuclei, both sets, the set Lucas, Locus ceruleus, Substantia nigra, that are the timers, the whole set of nuclei that runs our paralysis, and he has published that they have vitamin D receptors. Now, I, I, I am completely aware that if he had not published a context in which to understand this, I would not have gone the next step. But he says, gee, not only is vitamin D all over the brain stem, but it's in the pituitary. And he already has all the articles published that I presented to you. He explains in perfectly logical terms why vitamin D would be running our sleep. I gave you the punchline when I showed you that we're linked in the 365 day cycle of our planet. I fall into this literature and I think, this is the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. No one has written about this. I call up Walter Stumpf. I read a lot of his articles and he is the one who really, I feel, deserves the credit for this. He did not actually connect sleep to vitamin D. But I actually call him up and I say, look, I just made this clinical observation. Luckily, Walter's uh, retired by now, and he's willing to talk to me on the phone. And I'm telling him things like, your articles deserve a Nobel Prize. I mean, what? Why is it that nobody else sees it the same way you do? And he's very happy because I'm complimenting him. But ultimately, this is a sad outcome. This means in 2009, this is 40 years after the first article that's talking about brain receptors for vitamin D, I'm finally calling the author of these articles saying, has anybody written about sleep and D? And he says, no, they haven't. But that makes perfect sense. So, using Walter's scientific articles <clears throat> and my clinical observations, so I actually had one simple question. I know all of my patients are not sleeping normally. I also know nobody has any explanation for why they have no REM sleep, why they have sleep apnea, why they have REM apnea, why they have kicking. Could it be that there is a better vitamin D level that could make them sleep like I do when I sleep on the beach in Mexico? I seem to sleep better when I go to Mexico and go to the beach. I happen to be a sun lover. So my question was, let's look at your vitamin D level and let's see if we can make you feel better or sleep better. This chemical has scientific evidence that it affects the sleep. So together in 2012, Walter and I published the first article that describes that there is a specific vitamin D level that leads to better sleep. That level is 60 to 80. Now, we are now <clears throat> seven years since this article. This is still a hugely controversial item. Every single vitamin D expert, and I don't consider myself a vitamin D expert, I do consider myself a sleep expert, and I'm really much more interested in the sleep effects of this chemical, but every single vitamin D expert has a different level that they recommend. The tragedy is that the scientific studies, the large control trials, are done with fixed doses. Still, I went to the vitamin D workshop annual meeting this year, the big level of excitement over the fact that they had done fixed dose experiments that were case controlled, they were over 5,000 people, but they had given the experimental group 5,000 IUs of D. That would be like me saying, hey, Stephanie, I think all your medical problems are because your thyroid is off. You see right here your thyroid hormone level is off. I want you to go down to CVS and buy some thyroid and then I'll see you back in a year, and we'll do it again. What do you say? Even my lay patients say, well, wait a minute. Aren't, aren't you supposed to measure my blood level? Aren't you supposed to adjust it based on what my blood level is? That basic concept about the fact that D is a hormone, we are claiming that the level is low, then we give a fixed dose and then we say we're doing a scientific experiment where we average all the levels. 
that means we are not really looking at what is the effect of having a level of 60 versus having a level of 30. So this is still a big, difficult area. If you come to my course, we spend a lot of time on this because there is very strong controversy in the literature. My claim is this is easily felt by every single one of you in this room. You will be able to feel it in yourself and you will be able to see your patients get better. Now, I want you to, for a moment, put, put aside all the stuff that I've just told you about D, and now I want to move on to sleep, and you're going to be thinking about, my mother-in-law had a D level of 22, and her doctor put her on D2. I want you to put those ideas down. I want you to stay with me, because the next half of the lecture is about something that's even more important than that. So stay with me. The important part about this anatomy is that when you look at the actual anatomy that was published in the 1960s, if you look at it from the point of view of sleep, oh, this nucleus that's this long, skinny, reticulated set of nuclei is organized by anatomy. Well, we know that in slow wave sleep, where we grow, the only place, the only time when growth hormone is released is in slow wave sleep, we get paralyzed from the neck down. The only time we paralyze our oral airway is in rapid eye movement sleep, which is probably also when we do all the repair of the mechanical aspects of the mouth and the face. That means that's when the kid's face grows. And, uh-oh, diaphragm and chest wall can also be paralyzed. What does this imply? It implies that all of these problems are really on a continuum. If you see patients who have sleep apnea and central apnea, it's just a continuum. Could this also mean that sudden infant death syndrome, oh, by the way, that baby doesn't die when you're feeding her Cheerios at the table. She's a newborn that dies while she's sleeping. That means that this process could actually be the cause of SIDS, and it's so simple to fix. Moms who are pregnant need to be out in the sun or supplementing their vitamin D to make sure their D level is high enough that when the baby pops out, her vitamin D is good and the breast milk has enough D to feed the baby. This is an easily treatable problem. So when we look at it this way, we look at sleep disorders in this way, we begin to think about it in a totally different way and it actually brings us to a point where we can say, well, we're going to reorganize the way I think about sleep disorders. Doctors like to put things in little categories, especially when we don't know anything. When we know nothing, we make little lists, and we put things in lists, and then we say, okay, you have three, four, and five. That means you have blah, 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 and we name it. That doesn't help the patient. The patient says, okay, I have blah, blah, blah. Are you going to fix me? They don't care about what you call it. So I have now organized this in my own mind in this way. And the lucky thing is both of these types of disorders are actually coming from the same basic pathophysiology. You guys know about some things called cataplexy. Narcolepsy are attacks of sleep that happen while we're awake. Cataplexy is a wash of emotion that results in the person falling to the ground. Well, what I've just told you about is really this nucleus I just taught you about. This nucleus, picture what would happen if I don't sleep well for 25 years and my attachment of the clock and the paralysis becomes frayed so that I can actually have these guys get activated while I'm asleep. Okay, good, that's normal. What if they get activated when I'm awake? I become um, abruptly paralyzed. If you look at the fact that we were never, ever supposed to be able to be awake and asleep at the same time, any patient I tell that usually giggles because it seems so bizarre. But in fact, once you think of that idea, you will find patients that have become so sleep deprived 
that this very core of what allows them to heal themselves is actually frayed and disconnected to the point that these nuclei can become activ activated while they're awake. What will result? Things like cataplexy, immediate paralysis when you're awake. This is another disease that I've named kineoplexy with teenage girls coming to see me when I'm practicing neurology saying they fall to the ground in math class, they flop around like a fish, they're absolutely completely awake, but they can't speak. They can hear what the people say about them. They can't keep their body from moving. They come to my office saying, I've been told I have pseudo seizures. They don't even realize that the neurologist who gave them that diagnosis is actually making fun of them. The neurologist who says that to them is saying, you're making it up. And oh, by the way, do they have a basis for saying that? Of course they do, because this 16-year-old was cutting herself when she's 13. But if you go a little deeper into what the story is, her mom will tell you that this kid never slept as an infant. She hasn't slept since the day she was born. And yes, she is an emotional wreck. And that did happen before she began to have these events where she falls to the ground. If you start to put your sleep cap on with this f context fully prepared, then you think, oh, well, she's been so sleep deprived that she can actually be awake and asleep at the same time. And her nucleus reticularis pontus auralis caudalis just made her activate. Any of those muscles that can get paralyzed when we're sleeping, those nuclei must be able to turn them back on again or none of us would be here. That means that those nuclei control all the muscles of the body. So this is theoretical until I start to do the vitamin D and the other stuff I'm going to show you, and their sleep gets better and it goes away. This means that there are disorders that we are telling young people that they made up and we're making fun of them that are actually sleep disorders. And they're sleep disorders that are long-standing and they're fatal. They're ultimately fatal. I have had 23-year-olds who died from a pulmonary embolus sitting on the toilet who I know that the, the other things that happened to them before that, when that was their final death knell, were all about not having a terrible sleep disorder. So this switch, so the good thing is <clears throat> Cliff Saper back in the 2000s described that what we really have is sleep switches. Unfortunately, the actual um, model of how to do this, he put in a slightly different way. I just got a 15 minute mark and I'm gonna ask if there's any possibility of going slightly over. We're going into the lunch hour, maybe five minutes, because I know it's gonna take me a little while. Okay, I want you to think about this, asleep, awake, but never both. This explains a lot of the things we see in neurology. When I started to be able to fix people, there's another really important thing, which is that normal humans, without any preconceived notion, so I do not, I have not had a sleep fellowship. In my view, that means I was not brainwashed. I did not have any preconceived notions about what my patients were supposed to do. I had a lot of patients with terrible sleep disorders, including insomnia, and it turns out when you can figure out what biochemically is going wrong and fix them, then what you see is all humans fall asleep around the same time, nine or 10, and they all wake up at the same time, six or seven. So <clears throat> this, in my view, is the background for the diseases that we are looking at. It's not the only origin. I still believe that there are many other pathways but if you're not able to sleep and repair, you're not able to detoxify the body. If you don't have a normal immune system because you don't sleep normally, we're going to talk about the details of that in a minute, then you can't actually be immunized and assume that you're going to have the same immune system reaction to that immunization that I, in my, my generation in the 1960s and 70s, had to those immunizations. So in my view, the best level for normal sleep is 60 to 80. And why am I here? I'm going to speed up a little bit at this point. I'm here because <clears throat> we study sleep, and what happened to me was I started to go to the sleep meetings. I was very frustrated with neurology because I would go to the neurology meetings, and their, their segments on sleep were just basically listing off, describing things. And I would try to stand up and say, 
you know, you just talked about restless legs and you talked about periodic limbs of sleep and you talked about sleep apnea, done by a pulmonologist, by the way. Aren't these all just manifestations of not getting paralyzed com correctly? And there was just this silence. And I sat back down and thought, oh, well, I must be wrong. And the guy next to me said, I'm running a sleep lab for 20 years. They may not understand it, but you're right on target there. So this is an idea that not only I have. We study sleep in rodents, as I explained to you. Rodents actually do not sleep in the same way that we do. And more importantly, they're happy with D2. I gave D2 to about five of my most sick patients when I started this. And by the fifth patient who came back and said to me, you know, that prescription you gave me almost killed me. I couldn't sleep at all. I ached all over. I had terrible diarrhea. And the fifth patient said, you know, that stuff nearly killed me. So I went to Walmart. And I bought that D3 stuff that's over the counter. And I had only given it to people who had extremely low Ds, like zero, like undetectable vitamin D. It turns out that the human does not feel D2 and D3 are the same in the brain. No one's actually looked at that yet, but in my patients, it appears that the chemical that we make, that all other animals make, reptiles, insects, fish, birds, and mammals, all make D3. None of them make D2, yet the current recommendation for family practice for someone with a low D is a once a week D2 tablet, what rats use, not what humans use, in a dose of 50,000 a week. So we have some confusion about that. The second problem is, and I'm sitting in these, in, in these lectures, in the sleep meetings, and I was just blown away. The, the level of study, the level of intelligence of the sleep researchers is phenomenal. And I'm sitting in the audience going, I'm just a dumb neurologist in East Texas, and I have seen some things that these guys haven't seen. Why? And it's because we study sleep-deprived normals. We take normal medical students, we sleep-deprive them, we measure the cortisol level. I'm sorry, they are not my patients. These are my patients. They're sick as hell. And who is studying them? You are. You are their first line of treatment. You're their first line of listening to what's wrong with them. They have a disease. OK, now, here's the next part. It's going to be shortened. It's just as important as vitamin D. In fact, it's more important. And here's what happened. One, the vitamin D effect wore off in two years. That was very disappointing. I thought I had uncovered something that would change the world, but no. There's always something more complicated that happens. So at the end of two years, three things had not gotten better that are important things that I thought would get better. Walter has written about vitamin D receptors all over the GI tract. So I thought irritable bowel syndrome would be fixed by vitamin D, and it was not. The second thing was I had lots of fat women who were now exercising. They were walking at lunchtime when it was 100 degrees. They felt so much better that they were actually walking every day that even when I didn't tell them, but they didn't lose weight. I was convinced that they were obese because their vitamin D was low. But I didn't see them lose weight. And the third thing is, by the end of two years, most of us were starting to develop unexplained pain. I had this peculiar pain in my butt that I didn't understand. It would hurt to sit down. It was not related to my running. It was not related to exercise. My patients were coming back saying, I came to see you because I had daily headache. Now my headaches are back. And my D is 65. I just had it done last week. My sleep is terrible. And I feel worse than when I came in here. Now, because I'm doing something that's really weird and out there, and I already told you my colleagues thought I was a complete whack job, I'm taking responsibility for things that I wouldn't usually. Their rheumatoid arthritis type generalized arthritis would not usually be in my field. But I'm doing something that no one has ever done, as far as I can tell in the literature. At least they haven't reported it. And now they have these pains. So I have to think, gee, there's a time-related event that might be related to my vitamin D. At this point, two women come in who are in their late 30s, early 40s, both daily headache sufferers, complaining of burning in their hands and feet. 
I'm a neurologist. My subspecialty training is actually in neuropathy. I've been practicing for 30 years, and I can tell you burning in the hands and feet is exceedingly rare. I've probably seen three or four people with that in the whole time that I've been practicing, and it was always B12 related. Here's the problem. They're already on B12. Both of these ladies are on B12. I know what their B12 levels are, but it has a real B vitamin ring to it. And because I have no idea why they have this, and they are presenting within a month of each other, they have nothing in common. They both have daily headache. The only thing they have in common is they're seeing me, and they're taking vitamin D for two years. So now I'm really freaked out. At this point, one of my, client, one of my patients comes in and brings me a book. And I have to be truthful with you, people had started to bring me all sorts of things about essential oils and crystals and really wacky things that you guys may not have think, think are wacky, but I thought they were pretty wacky at the time. And I would say, oh, thank you, and then I would promptly throw it away. She brings me the book and she makes me promise that I'll read it and that I'll give it back to her. It took me about two months to read it because she was coming back. And I read it and I realize the reason why she brought it to me was not because of the rheumatoid arthritis, which is not my field, this is a book about a vitamin, about pantothenic acid. Again, I know nothing about vitamins. I'm very skeptical. But by now, I'm desperate. I can't sit down at the end of the day. My butt hurts for no apparent reason. My sleep is terrible. And what she says in this book is, I give 400 milligrams of pantothenic acid to these other lay people. This is a layman. She gives 400 milligrams because there is a big literature about pantothenic acid and rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases starting in the 1940s going through the 1970s. She gives 400 milligrams, and not only does their pain go away, but their sleep gets better. And she has references. So I go to the references, which are very... Um, suspect in that they were done in the 1950s. They're done in this little laboratory that's right next to the Iowa State Prison, and they're done on convicts. And what they've done in these experiments is they've tube-fed convicts over a period of two weeks a blocker of B5, and they've fed them a B5-deficient food-like preparation. These same laboratory <laughs> scientists were actually asked to do an editorial about scientific experiments on convicts, which became illegal 10 years after this. So, needless to say, these experiments have not been repeated. Now, what they published was, in two weeks of blocking B5 by itself, what they saw was burning in the hands and feet, a funny puppet-like gait, belly problems, and <clears throat> they couldn't sleep. So, now I have a vitamin that causes insomnia. Now, I go down to Drug Emporium and I buy 400 milligrams of panathenic acid. Because I know nothing about the B vitamins, I say, hey, what I remember from medical school is if you give one B, you should give all of them. And I pick up another thing called B50. And it's a non, it's a non proprietary mix of 50 milligrams or 50 micrograms of all eight Bs. That is really important. Now. The first thing that happened was I got restless legs within four days, and I realized that I was giving a dose that was too big. I really didn't know what the right dose was, and since I have now become extremely skeptical about all vitamin literature because of my experience with vitamin D, and this, these publications, I've just given myself the recommended dose, I get terrible restless legs from it, my sleep gets worse, and I realized for the next three months I'm going to have to talk to the 40 people who I gave this recommendation to. Most of the people came back and said, this 400 milligrams of this stuff nearly killed me. So 30 out of 40 of the people I gave this to said, this is the recommended dose in all the books. This stuff made me so agitated, I could only take it for two days, and I stopped it, and I couldn't sleep. Some of them fired me. And then a couple of them said, they did the same thing I did, which was to stop the 400 milligrams, and then they said, but this B50, this is like a miracle. I stopped the 400 milligrams, and in two days, my pain went away, my sleep got better. And I said, that's what happened to me. I was afraid to tell anybody, because it was too weird. It happened too fast. Okay, so the two ladies with the burning, gone in two days. Now, here's where there's a very weird disconnect with all the literature I'm going to read elsewhere. It says, 
when I'm reading the articles, so now I'm reading all the articles I can about the B vitamins, and particularly B5. All of the literature says panathetic acid deficiency does not exist because it's in every food. Well, I've just given it to a bunch of people. If it was in every food, it would mean that all of us would get insomnia if we ate too much. That means it can't be in every food. And why did it take two years? It appears to me that I improved their sleep, I improved their repairs, and now two years later, they have this onset of what looks like a B vitamin deficiency state. Could it be that there are body stores? And in fact, there are body stores. So going back to the literature, there are several articles about B vitamin stores. B6, B5, thiamine, and vitamin C, all water soluble, all have body stores. And the most interesting part was, I happened on an article that says, riboflavin has an intestinal bacteria source and a food source. Thiamine, or an intestinal bacteria source and a food source. Panathenic acid, intestinal bacteria source and a food source. And at this point I go, wait a minute, I know all these people I'm giving this to have IBS. What if their bacteria has gone bad? What if their bacteria requires vitamin D? What if the vitamin D deficiency leads to the IBS because you've really replaced the normal species of bacteria with species that don't need vitamin D and therefore the IBS is a secondary effect of the vitamin D? And oh, by the way, would that mean that if all the B vitamins were actually always made by the microbiome, that... We've now developed a whole population that has vitamin D deficiency and secondary B deficiencies. So there's a timing that's related to this, and I now know that I've given vitamin D to these people for two years. If their bacteria want vitamin D, why didn't the bacteria come back? I told you that the IBS didn't go away. So now I'm very fixated on you know, I have no idea what dose of these bees to give, and I'm very skeptical about the vitamin literature. Basically, science dropped the vitamins in the 1980s, and ever since then, it's been dogma. You have opinions, you have very little science. So what I think is, you know, if we can get the bacteria to come back, the only people on the planet, the only organisms on the planet that really know what the right mix of these eight chemicals that are pivotal for every single cell in our body is the intestinal bacteria. Now, what do those guys need? My husband happens to hand me an article from the Economist Journal that's a summary of the last 10 years of the GI literature. Why? Because IBS and the wrong microbiome is big news. If you can figure out a way to fix it, you may make a lot of money. I'm gonna to try to convince you that it's really simple to bring them back, and it's not about the supply. It's about recreating their environment. So, what I'm doing now is I'm saying, gee, there are four sum of bacteria. All mammals have this four set of bacteria around the planet. What if there's a foursome that's a symbiotic foursome that feeds each other these B vitamins? That's their requirement, to hang out together. And there are other articles substantiating that idea as well that unfortunately didn't come until later. But we have articles that show that certain species make riboflavin, certain species make thiamine. What if they're feeding each other? What if it's really a symbiotic organization that we feed them D, they require D, I gave them a bunch of D. What do they need? And I think, you know, Maybe the foursome that we've been trying to replace all this time with those probiotics are really down there, but they're so far away. They have piles of poop. They have piles of this bad bacteria in between them. So this guy that's making thiamine can no longer get it to this guy that it used to trade for riboflavin. So now what I've actually got are a bunch of patients who are on B50, which is giving large doses of the B vitamins, and D, and Within three months, the IBS goes away, just like that. I have people who have not pooped normally since they were born coming in saying, I've been seeing you for eight years. My headaches are better. The vitamin D helped me, but I'll tell you what. I wake up every day and I have a bowel movement in the morning. It is a miracle. So making the poop bacteria come back is not that hard. All you need is a vitamin D over 40 and a large dose 
all eight Bs in combination. So it's really about making the environment of the intestinal contents duplicate what these guys used to make. I'm sorry I'm running over. Let me tell you just a couple of really brief things. We're going to jump through this. Obviously, animals have lived in the ground for six months. That means the B vitamins had to be created by their... This is why it's important to you. Pantothenic acid is one of the basic components of coenzyme A. Coenzyme A does very important things for us. Coenzyme A is what's in every food. It's not pantothenic acid. B5, I believe, is the only, the only source for B5 for any of us is in the gut bacteria. We take that B5, it's absorbed through a specific pump, it goes right up into the brain, and it's pumped into the brain with the same pump that pumps it into the GI tract as B5, and then it makes cortisol. That means that the original literature about rheumatoid arthritis was attached to this because when you're B5 deficient, you don't have normal cortisol levels. Coenzyme A also makes melatonin. That means when I take away your B5 by giving you the wrong microbiome, I've taken away your melatonin and I've taken away a very important chemical, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is what actually allows us to get paralyzed in sleep. B5, remember my patients who said, this stuff nearly killed me? I spent years trying to figure out why that happened to them. Acetylcholine is a chemical that manages our level of alertness during the day and then a switch flips and it manages our ability to move through the stages of sleep and get paralyzed at night. That's already in the sleep literature. So it turns out that vitamin D and B5 are actually synergistic. Coenzyme A provides the acetyl portion. Vitamin D in those cells that I showed you makes an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase that makes acetylcholine. Here is a diagram for where acetylcholine is used in the brainstem to make us paralyzed and to affect the timers of sleep. And there's one other important piece. The autonomic nervous system, which those of you who do heart rate variability are very interested in. All the same diseases that are connected to sleep apnea and to vitamin D deficiency have also been shown to have increased sympathetic tone. We've been telling you that that happens because of the stress of stopping breathing. But there's another way to look at it. These are two different nervous systems that are oppose each other and help each other. The parasympathetic nervous system slows the heart rate, it decreases the blood pressure, it increases GI tract motility, it's actually got to do with the sensory supply. What would it look like if because you don't have the supply of B5 to have a parasympathetic supply of acetylcholine. The parasympathetic runs completely on acetylcholine. The fight-flight side of sympathetic runs on adrenaline, noradrenaline. What would it look like? It would look like all the things that we see every day in our patients. So could it be that irritable bowel syndrome is actually a message even if you don't have irritable bowel, if you have the wrong microbiome, you actually do not have the raw material to have a normal parasympathetic nervous system. In my view, this is what we've been sold. I think it's really more about not having the raw material. And let me just add this one brief thing. I think that low D has direct effects on the nose. We have articles that show that. Nasal congestion then leads to mouth breathing. Mouth reading to breathing leads to palatal changes. Palatal changes lead to a smaller airway. So I am not trying to sell you the idea that the oral airway development is not important. It's really important. You just need to address both issues. Now, in my view, what we're seeing is an old, old set of diseases. These are all diseases that used to happen in the elderly. They're all happening in children now. They're all happening earlier. The three steps that explain this in our patients, simple, the brain runs the oral airway, vitamin D runs the sleep, and the gut is even more important. If you give vitamin D and you don't bring the back the microbiome, almost everyone gets terrible pain from it. So there's a simple regimen that allows you to correct these problems in all patients.
I'm not trying to say that heart disease and stroke and hypertension are all easily curable, but I am trying to say that if you stick with it, even the sickest of the sick who've been sleeping badly, badly for 30 years, if you focus on getting the sleep better and you keep at it and you recognize that someone has been sicker longer, has a huge repair deficit and must therefore sleep better longer, you can help all of your patients with a simple regimen that I would love to teach you. And I'm sorry I've run over. Do I have time for questions or no? Okay. Thank you so much for your attention. Let's give her a hand.